for you. No, not possible. Are we on? Oh, you're going to go outside. You're going to go out of the room. Yeah. I need to find uh, Seek of Strength live. Are we live? We're live. Are we sure? I see no one. We're live. Oh, we're live. Upcoming. Oh, we're live. Oh, we're live. Oh, yeah. The audio is hot. Oh, yeah. The audio is hot. <clears throat> but there's. Uh, the audio is phenomenal. I can hear it on my phone here. I can hear it on your phone from out here. Let me just. Woohoo! No, it's so good. What's going to happen now is you're going to walk in and pull down a load of wires. I can't do a video by myself here in this. Just be like, oh, so God, Dar's not here. I can just sit in my armchair and talk about stuff, you know? Talk about yeah, stoicism. The light. Yeah, stoicism with a little lamp. An hour and a half video coming stoicism next week when you're on holidays. How do we change from top chat to live chat to live chat? So we're going to have to, we need to fix the setup. What we need is a joint 65 inch screen back there for reaction videos. Yes. Is really what we need. And a wireless mouse. Yeah. Obviously, I've been controlling the mouse because you can't be trusted. Is, uh, oh, there's loads of comments. If you could let us know what the audio and video quality is like, it would be great. I need to tilt. Oh, no, that camera's all right. I think it's okay. What color would you call these jeans, sir? Uh, stonewashed denim. Stonewashed denim, oddly specific. Patrick Bradford says, lads, lads, lads. Lads, lads, lads. Mr. Green Apple says, what's up, nerds? Love the setup from Hey Miles. <laughs> Morning from Washington State. There's two. Dr. Demographic says, the boom is back. The boom <laughs> is back. There's two there's two Washingtons in America, isn't there? There's like Washington State and Washington DC. Washington, yeah. District, American side. District Columbia. That's come on, like District Columbia. New New York. New York. Come up with new names, that's come on. Come on. Pittsburgh. Nothing like a bit of Gert and Dairy going live in Washington State. Evening, lads. Looking inside. Evening. 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 Where are you? Evening. Somebody is way off. You're in Australia. Evening, lads. Oh. Audio is great. Looks good. Audio seems fine, but I wouldn't really know. Hmm. That sounds good. Okay. Oh, David Delgado with a great one. Rank best to worst. Pancakes, waffles, and French toast. I just have <sighs> clarification on the question, David. When we talk about pancakes, are we discussing Ireland, crepes yeah. or American-style pancakes? In so? Ireland, pancakes are the crepe. Uh, but I just... Where's David Delgado? Delgado makes me believe American. I'm going to say he's a guido on Jersey Shore. Oh my god. I don't know. That's a racial he, slur. He oh, oh sorry, he says American pancakes. You can't be racist against Well then people. I would say French toast, American pancakes, and then waffles. Waffles are definitely last. Yeah. French toast and pancakes, it really depends on the pancake or the French you toast. You put French toast first. Yeah. I just think French toast is just so universally great. I'm gonna say my mouth is watering a little bit more when I think about pancakes than it is for is it? a French toast, but I'd probably put pancakes. American style pancakes first. Do you like sweet or savory pancakes? Oh, sweet. I like savory pancakes for me or just they're trying too hard. Maple syrup and bacon, no? Oh, yeah, that's sweet. Maple syrup. And bacon. Come on. And pig. Come like, on. And pig. Come on. And pig. That's like somebody getting a salad and putting deep fried pieces of cheese on top of it. Like. Can you do that? Yeah. It's called a loomy. <laughs> the brie. I made some unbelievable uh, pan fried oh, cheese oh, we, sandwiches. We just nailed it. What? So he goes, he's from Texas. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and he said Hispanic, not a... Uh, oh my God. He's not a he's not Italian. Or Italian. Italian. You're blurry or I'm hungover. It looks not to be blurry. Let me just check. I need to tilt that camera slightly. So Gareth, will you just keep the show going there? Uh, I can do that. Audible, audibly and visibly crisp and clear. I'm not seeing... Don't pull any cables out now. As you wouldn't think it, but Dara is actually like a bull in a china shop. Routinely, he'll just walk into things around the office. Things that will be clearly there. You know, it's not like things that came out of nowhere. He'll just burst in through something. And then, and then the favorite bit is he'll look really surprised that it happened. He'll be like, oh my God, who put that there? Um, okay, you see a lot of gooch now, like, to be honest with you. That's okay. Just very Gucci. Yeah. Stuffed French toast is king. Stuffed French toast. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have a real question here from George Ladder. Sorry, not a real question. An actual sports question. Oh, um, very crisp on the thing. 
Afternoon, lads. Would you advise cutting creatine as part of weight cut for weight of thing? Are there sports when you say creatine isn't worth the weight? Uh, I think for most people, the creatine weight, the creatine weight is something that kind of levels out after a few days. So it's unlikely you're currently retaining weight from creatine from what I've seen uh, has been an issue. However, it's if it's a concern and you're trying to cut weight and you uh, need the extra pounds yeah. or kilos, just drop it for a few days. It won't make that much of a difference. Uh, I wouldn't be too concerned about it, but I'd be surprised yeah, if at I, this stage you're retaining much extra weight from creatine. I would say, but is it weightlifting competition? He said, yeah. Weightlifting competition, it doesn't really matter. But I don't. The thing is, so if you're using creatine monohydrate, you're not going to, as Gurf said, it will level off fairly quickly after around a week or so i don't i don't think you'll notice any actual difference in the amount of weight retained with or without creatine i i don't think i know broderick's talked before about uh stenazinol and the drop of around 10 percent, five to ten percent of body weight upon cessation of of that but creatine is not stenazinol. But creatine is not stenazinol unfortunately for everyone involved so i, I do despite your mother's opinion <laughs> creatine is not stenazinol. Uh, so I, I don't think it would make a massive difference if it was for a sport other than weightlifting where the the work rate was a bit higher. So if you were a boxer or a jiu-jitsu athlete or a rugby player, I would certainly want to be taking creatine all the way up to competition because creatine is going to have that performance enhancing effect all the way through that competition. Um, so just be conscious of that, that if you are in the kind of 10 second window of massive power outputs whether you're a sprinter or a bobsledder or something like that you don't want to be c- ceasing the creatine too early jamaican or otherwise jamaican or otherwise so yeah david is hispanic not italian uh stuff's french toast king lemon juice and pancakes top tier that is a quintessential irish addition to pancake tuesday is yes lemon and lemon sugar. and sugar that's that would be if i was to have one pancake for the rest of my life Lemon and sugar. Yeah. I would just do Nutella. Would you? I think you need to pull the mic directly in front of you. This is like here, you know? No, they seem to say The it's lads okay. are saying it's more fun when you look at your phone. Is it? Yeah. Who's saying that? I'm uh, at the wrong angle. That's because you yeah. gave me the shit mic stand. Oh, my God. Yeah, there I gave everything. But you've got yogurt stains in the other mic stand there. I changed the pop, the pop filter. Pop filter. Oh, it's called teething problems. There we go. We did say today we were just going to have to go live and see how it goes. That won't go down anymore. It won't go down anymore. Yeah, you. Yeah, I love how you gave me the broken one. Yeah. Dickhead. So who's up next? Dickhead. Uh, late Pate is up next. Late Pate, Latte Pate, says, Hi, guys. How, should you aim for neutral spine in the squat? Yes. Uh, I think one thing that's changed in recent years is the lack of the term neutral spine or flat back or flat spine. And they'll talk about a neutral range. So there's definitely a range of acceptable back angles for the squat, for the deadlift, for cleans and snatches. Um, But yes, you should always aim for neutral. For most people, that will look like a small amount of extension in the lumbar spine um, and then pretty flat with the... uh, the upper back basically stays pretty flat, but a small amount of extension in the lower back is kind of normal neutral for most people. Mm-hmm. How's that going down it's just at the, the limit of its angle. <clears throat> Perfect. Perfect. So... Uh, okay. Not that strong, says regular commenter, says, if you only have time for one pull movement a session, would you prioritize snatch or clean pulls, deadlifts or RDLs, single leg deadlifts, etc.? So in terms of snatch pulls or clean pulls or snatch deadlifts or clean deadlifts, it really depends what your aim is at that time. If you were talking to most of my weightlifters at the moment, it would be a snatch pull or a snatch deadlift. Because most people have more issues with the first and second pull in the snatch than they do certainly the first pull in the clean. So it's just a 
slightly different movements, slightly different demands, and possibly you might need some more technical work on the snatch. Um, but if you're somebody who's clean, needs a lot of technical work, then certainly a clean deadlift or a, oh my God. Every fucking every time. time. Certainly a clean deadlift or a clean pull is uh, would be prioritized. You know? But it is very much the kind of flavor of the month for whether you should do snatch deadlifts or clean deadlifts or snatch pulls or clean pulls. Um, but most people will need more technical work on the, on the snatch than they will on the clean. Yeah. Yeah, you get a lot of bang for your buck for those. Bethany Wadsworth is asking, afternoon, can you do extra bodybuilding alongside the wasting blocks or the beginner wasting program want to gain weight as much as with muscle mass as possible? Yeah, you absolutely can. So obviously there is a lot of assistance exercises, ex exercises included in both programs and same with wasting 2.0. But you can add additional stuff. Just make sure that it makes sense in the context of your training and where you are in relation to the program. So if you've, you know, heavy snatches the next day, don't do a lot of uh, tricep work the day before or a lot of uh, bicep and shoulders or something like that. Make sure that the assistance work fits in accordingly with the following days so that you're not fatigued. So make sure it's uh, following the principles you know, of good programming and uh, you're not sabotaging yourself by doing extra work and sabotaging the day in terms of the micro with the macro progress in mind uh, that you're making sense when you do that assistance work. One thing I will say as well, that we've had weightlifters in the past where they'll want to do extra hypertrophy work for the point or for the, the aim of adding muscle mass uh, or wanting to add muscle mass in particular areas for maybe the aesthetic appeal of it. And they're not in a caloric position where hypertrophy will occur or they're not having enough protein or they're not sleeping well enough. And the actual organism isn't in a place where it's going to build any muscle you'll still make some progress in terms of your strength outcomes and your technique outcomes but you're not going to be easily able to put on muscle because you're not eating enough or not sleeping well enough or you'll be too stressed or you don't have enough protein so it is definitely something to look at if you're adding in hypertrophy work make sure you're in a in a state of being that's receptive to adding some muscle uh Christopher Tack said, afternoon lads, have you ever produced or seen a resource which summarizes the differences in systems across countries? So we did actually do a podcast a couple of years ago, maybe the year before last, on our views across the systems. But I can actually, now we'll probably make a longer video than this at some stage, but I'll actually just get to the point here with this video. Uh, all the best countries basically do the same thing. And I know this sounds kind of like a non-answer, and I know it's not the answer you're looking for. Uh, there is a little bit of nuance in the detail. And there is some nuance in the, the technical aspects. Actually, sometimes there's a lot of nuance in technical aspects, but ultimately all of the best from all those countries ended up doing the same thing. And it's essentially a lot of snatches, clean and jerks, uh, and they were quite strong. The programming is pretty similar, the structure. I know when I was a newer lifter, I was kind of wondering, I was under the impression, or I might have thought that a lot of the countries have really different systems, but in reality, they all follow the same principles. Everyone's looking to be strong as possible fast as possible, uh, as best technique as possible, and do snatch clean jerk as frequently as possible. And you'd be surprised that the programs all look much more similar. The Venn diagrams would overlap so much more than would be not overlapping or outside those kind of center of, of convergence, between the convergence of spheres there. They would be way more in the center than others. And we'll see that from, you know, we've had a good sea of Romania, Germany, we've seen Qatar, uh, we've I've seen a lot of Russian stuff. Uh, we got to see some Kazakhstan when we were there. Um, have we seen anyone else? I feel like there's something Did you say the German system? Yeah, it was the Germans, yeah. And like they're all, and what we've seen online from other people and talking to lifters. Um, obviously, we've talked to a couple of Russian made lifters as well, like Victor, for example. I had a good chat with him about that. And we've seen a lot, some of the literature from Kazakhstan, and it's all of the same. It's so, yeah. it's actually an interesting fact that it's all so similar. It's very rarely different. There's a different kind of everyone's using the same paint and the same canvas, and everyone's trying to paint the same picture, but it just looks a little different. Everyone's trying to paint the, the brush strokes are different. Yeah, the brush strokes are different. 
uh the type of drugs used are a little bit different but ultimately it's taking sorry i forgot to mention that it's uh it's taking drugs essentially taking drugs for as long as possible and as close to competition as possible and as and as much as possible when yeah. you're weight class from what we've seen yeah you know it's that's quite important from what we've seen and then it's just lots of such clean according drugs. to some of the people we talked to it's the most important thing my favorite is the german system yes because from what we are told at the moment there's either no drugs or very very little drugs in the german system from what we're told uh i'm not sure i'm not sure if i 100 percent buy into that but that's what we've been told uh but i love their technical system and i love how they support their technical system with their training your technique is the training and your training is the technique these are one and the same your training supplements your technique and supports your technique and your technique then reflects what kind of training you're able to do they're the same thing you know and the german system has really understood that and bought into it and I love their technical model. And you can just see that it's so... Oh, and the Ukrainian system as well. And mm -hmm. a little bit of Georgian actually as well now. And it's all, it's so similar. It's the same, same stuff. But you can see that if you start trying to do one kind of technique, but you're not supporting that technique with your training, you better be making up for it with a lot of drugs. Yeah. Uh, and what I like with the German system is their, their system is working like this. They're fitting together perfectly. Yeah. So they're like this, like a yeah. glove. It's a multidisciplinary team. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's how you'd expect Germans to do weightlifting, really. And the German system as well is very, very replicatable. If you're somebody who's like an amateur weightlifter in a normal country where you're going to get tested at your normal national level meets, uh, you're going to be able to do the German system to a fairly high degree or, or to a fairly good kind of, you'll have a good rattle off it. Um, if you were to take like the Kazakh system that we've looked at and done papers or paper reviews of their um, kind of published programming, there's no way you'd be able to do that system, you know, in the same way where if you were to run the Bulgarian system to the best of your ability, um, I know some people run like Bulgarian light on all these different things, you're not going to be able to use those systems as they were meant to be used uh, whereas the german system or the kind of european system on a whole the ewf system that's taught is a very very r repeatable and kind of just usable system for normal people yeah. uh, i love talking about that and i love seeing about that stuff but yeah for like the short answer it's basically the same thing um dan ray says lads i've just had Back extension rows plus hold in my program for the first time. And I did it on a 45 degree back extension. Is this correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's written. If you were to do that, like as written perfectly, you do it on a stand, like a 90 degree back extension. But on a 45, it's absolutely perfect. You'll probably be able to use a bit more weight. The hold at the end of it will be a bit easier because obviously you're, you're taking out some of that angle. Um, but absolutely, that's perfectly acceptable. For a lot of those accessory movements, just finding a piece of equipment that you can do them on is the most important thing. And being able to do them reliably from week to week and build and, and progress from week to week is the important thing. Not necessarily that it is exactly the same, you know. So for a lot of people, um, being able to do seal rows or ironing board rows is quite difficult in their gym or in their home gym. And so they might have to use a 45 degree bench and kind of lie down on the 45 degree bench prone. Uh, or they might have to put their flat bench up on some boxes and they'll have to do it with dumbbells instead of a barbell. All of these things are just part of kind of training in the, the real world, you know, training in a non-ideal situation. So yeah, that'll be absolutely perfect. Yeah. Mr. Greenapple says, who is your barber, Gurf? Let me have a word with him. I hope it's a compliment. Seems, him. Seems like a shot. So that's a bit of a shot. Right? Yeah. Uh, Giovanni wouldn't be happy. Would not be happy. Uh, Jimmy Tyson says, morning, boys. And then banana bread banana emoji and bread emoji says gum question regarding Adderall or Ritalin in sports in a prior stream you guys recommended against the use of such drugs in sports why wouldn't it facilitate greater learning like more reps equals more learning though so the problem with those particular drugs is that you're limiting neural plasticity in the long run so neural plasticity the ability of your brain to to adapt and to build these new relationships in one part of the brain to the other for those synapses to fire over and back, that seems to be negatively affected by the use of those drugs for off-label use. So for performance enhancing use, it would seem as though you're limiting neural plasticity in the long run. So it might seem like you're getting a lot of work done, but you're probably not getting too much work done. Now, 
That being said, people use those kind of amphetamine drugs to great effect in sport. They also use things like stenazinol and Tren for great use in sport. Is it the best move for you long term for you to get better at the sport? No, it's definitely not. Is it the best thing for your health long term? No, definitely not. So um, I'm just always cognitive of the the neural stuff. Having been somebody whose brain is messed up, you really don't want to mess with your brain. So things like caffeine and stuff like that, everyone will see like if you're a regular coffee drinker, you might have two cups of coffee a day and some pre-workout a few times a week. Uh, I would encourage you to go off all stimulants for 10 days and see how terrible you feel when you're off them. And that's the the kind of reliance that those receptors have in your brain. Those nicotinic receptors are frightfully uh, impactful on your brain, on your everyday life. And you'll, you'll have no real idea how impactful they are until you cleave yourself off caffeine or cleave yourself off nicotine or cleave yourself off some other sort of stimulant like that. Now, I drink coffee every single day or most days, definitely four or five days a week, I'd have coffee. I don't think everyone should stop drinking coffee forever. It's a great thing. Caffeine is a great drug to use. But for people who are constantly leveraging stimulants, uh, constantly leveraging any sort of kind of increase in neural activity, it's a dangerous, slippery slope. Yeah, I think the, the use of those kind of psychostimulants and the use of not Adderall, but the methamphetamine-related objects or the uh, the drugs that people do use um are, are quite interesting so anything in relation to that brain chemistry stuff is always uh <laughs> it's really a good idea unless you need it for treatment i think and it's it, there's something like i think the u.s students over half of college students use adderall on a regular basis i think if you look at some of the research there's kind of showing that uh, if you just use it the changes to your brain structure it certainly has an influence on the structure of your brain but it seems to be transient, the impacts on it, if you don't abuse it. Uh, but if you continue, the fine line between abuse and the use is the problem when it comes to your brain, is that you just won't know until it's probably too late. So you, uh, see, you see an increase of that kind of addictive behavior when I think you abuse things like Adderall. And it's unfortunately, once you've got the brain rot, it's hard to get rid of brain rot, and they're usually too late. So it's not like when you're squatting, you're like, my knees are kind of sore. You're like, I better back off squatting. It's like, shit, I've used too much Adderall, you know? Um, <laughs> no, so, it's like, oh, geez, I'm finding it really hard to add up normal numbers in my brain and I'm 35. Listen, if I was in a scenario where Olympic gold meant 5 million in the bank and my family were sorted forever, would I be leveraging modafinil and whatever else I needed to be winning? Absolutely. 100%. But if I'm a routine athlete and I just really into training and I want to make sure everything is correct and maybe I'm above and beyond that kind of hobbyist and I really want to get better regardless of what it means financially or, or lifestyle I just still wouldn't be using that at all uh, that kind of that kind of mindset doesn't seem conducive to beneficial learning training sessions uh, and most sessions we're trying to learn you know most sports are skill based and you're also going to be fine tuning that process and you don't want an association system where your skill development or your skill production is based on a certain level of brain chemistry which might be induced by Adderall I wouldn't like that scenario, given that if you don't have access to Adderall or you're going to have to put yourself in a stage where you have to abuse Adderall essentially to maintain that skill level, is that a good place to be in? Definitely not, because it is ultimately is a crutch then. Uh, I don't know how much research there is in relation to Adderall and skill development and skill retention, but I would imagine it negatively affects your sleep and sleep quality prior to and post skill development is very, very important. So. I just can't imagine outside of acute events would Adderall be even that useful. I know there's other stimulants. Modafinil is quite popular among athletes. Um, Nicotine. Clen and, and related um, stimulants like that. I so said not, not necessarily stimulants, but they do act like stimulants for athletes. Um, you know, bronchodilators. Uh, you would have seen the Egyptian team there last year testing positive. Most of the team tested positive for a, uh, a bronchodilator that also acts as a stimulant for training. You just see those things, like you see weightlifters. You just right. How many weightlifters love Clen in the international scene? You'd actually be shocked, uh, or even athletes in general. Clen is very popular and, and modafinil, but that is also a reflection of their mindset. 
because uh, they're yeah. nuts. They're insane. They're lunatic. They're fucking mental. Yeah. Uh, if you want to have an idea for what lack of neuroplasticity or lack of cognitive ability feels like, if you do an all nighter, um, or if you just stay up super late and get up super early the next morning, get like three or four hours sleep, and then try and learn something new. So whether you want to take out a a book and try and remember the last page of that chapter, or if you want to try and do some very simple mental arithmetic, you'll have an idea for what that kind of down regulation of cognitive processes feels like. Um, and that's what the the long term implications could be. So obviously, if you're prescribed that stuff, you should definitely take it. And that's you work with your doctor on that. But and, uh, and it seems very productive for people. I know some people who've not some people, one or two people who have had adults diagnosed ADHD and they've taken it and they said it's been crazy and they don't yeah. know how they've gotten this long it's without mad. it, which is very impressive. But then also there's people who've been misdiagnosed with it and it's fucked them up. Uh, Henry Rollins is a great example of that. If, you yeah. know, if anyone knows who Henry Rollins is, you should go down a rabbit hole. He's one of my favorite people. Uh, he was given Ritalin when he was younger and he said it was just essentially not the best. Yeah. Uh, Sean Colton says, Hey lads, do you know any gym in the north of Ireland that could teach me how to power clean? So there's Gainfort gym might be useful. There might be, I'm not sure who's coaching in Gainfort. It's a great gym for training. Fanta- fantastic gym. Yeah. That's where we went to train with Clarence the uh, summer before last. There's Gabriel's weightlifting. Uh, is Gabriel's weightlifting? St. Saint Saint Gabriel. St. Gabriel's? Gabriel's weightlifting. Someone there might be able to help you out. Uh, if Ronnie White was still there. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure at the moment who else could help you. There's loads of gyms in the north, a lot of great gyms, but I don't know who might be able to help you power clean. Obito says, thank you lads for recommending the Antas. I got too impatient waiting for the new tier shoes and so got the Antas and I'm really enjoying them. I loved the Antas. I still do love the Antas. I have that white and blue pair. I had a red and yellow pair. Really, really liked them. The only reason I got rid of them is because they were the wrong size for me. Um, I think they're very, very, very good. They're just small bit heavier than the ROM 2s and think they're more stable depending on certain people's style of lifting. They might be a better shoe than the ROM 2, but uh, they're certainly a close second for me. I went and looked for the tier there last week and actually see if I could just buy a pair. Uh, but I... You said they're a crazy price. Yeah, so, well, Rogue were selling them for like €240, Euro, but you couldn't buy them anyway. They're all out of stock everywhere, Rogue, with. Uh, wherever so you could buy them in kind of Europe, they're all out of stock. Um, I just hard pressed to find the shoe that would be nicer than Ram 2s, to be honest. But I'd like, I really want to try the tier shoes because they're very good things. I've actually, a couple of people have said to us that they didn't like them, but I've seen a lot of people say they really like them, you know. And uh, obviously, I'd, I'd hope for Aaron's sake that they're a good shoe, yeah, you know? absolutely. So yeah. I'd be very keen to try them. Uh, dreadful says thoughts on nicotine as performance enhancer for weightlifting training like chewing on nicotine gum. Funny we just kind of talked about that. Yeah, we literally just touched on it. But nicotine's very, very, very effective. The big, massive, huge, gaping hole that is the problem with nicotine Mm -hmm. is it's insanely addictive. Not for everyone. Not for everyone. Genetically. I don't get addicted to it at all. Uh... I used nicotine last year a lot when I was training for the run the squat. Yeah. A lot. Mm-hmm. More than I used caffeine. Mm-hmm. Um, very, very effective mm-hmm. in terms of that cognitive stimulus. But um, I don't like any stimulants before training anymore. You don't? Not in the last few years. Those running sessions, it was like really, really helped to get through them. When I'm going for... A big squad again. I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll, I'll get some stab, stiblins, stablins, stiblins. Most of the squads. Am I taking too much Adderall? <laughs> <laughs> um, did I get my meth and my Adderall mixed up again? At most of the squat sessions I did last year, I didn't take anything for it. Do you know one thing that weightlifting has over jujitsu for me is that there's no singular moment of hype in jujitsu, and I know there's moments of kind of victory or whatever, but there's no clear run up to a situation where you can kind of listen to music and you can get hyped, you know, and if you yeah. need to do semblance or whatever, 
and then there's a successful precise piece of movement now there is obviously loads of precise movement in jiu-jitsu but there's no there's no build up to a gorgeous crescendo no there's no isolate and sometimes there is of course but mm. there's no there are opportunities you can't really capitalize on them you can't hype yourself up before them you know yeah. you're waiting for an opportunity to get them but when it comes to weight of thing there's this feeling even if it's a hundred kilo snatch for me at the moment if i'm trying to get a nice one it's just a really nice little, and there's so many of them across sessions. Yeah. And if we're talking about brain plasticity and changing and structure your brain association things, like my brain is heavily indebted into lifting and dopamine, you know, and, and quality sessions because it's been so, so long, you know. And that's one thing, a weight of thing is that you get these little nuggets of hype and rewards. Yeah. You and you really get them do. session after session, especially if you're better at weightlifting or you're good at weightlifting mm. you successfully hit the what you perceive to be good weightlifting movements you know and jiu-jitsu is great because you get even, nice things but you but don't even after training mm -hmm. yeah and you're re-watching the videos you're mm -hmm. like, oh that was nice and that's obviously jiu-jitsu is incredibly satisfying in other ways in but other ways this particular avenue something about it is just so satisfying yeah that that run up to those particular things uh Gaxi Hunter said, had RTA week four day one yesterday. The weighted GHD sit up <laughs> killed me, and I'm verified for day two. Uh, day two of week four is uh, it's it. intense. But look, if you want to get better, you have to do hard things. Dr. Demographics IE says, is Seek Asleep being made in the fine laboratory laboratories of the People's Republic of Cork? It's being made in the fine laboratories of the uh, Dominican Republic of Wexford. What's Wexford's nickname? Very close. The yellow bellies. The what? The yellow bellies. They're called the yellow bellies. Yeah. I've never heard that. The yellow bellies. What's clear again? The, the yellow bellies. Cork's Rebel County. Oh, sorry. In terms of like the county. Sorry, the, the GA team are called the yellow bellies. because what's, what's the county? Yellow. What is the county? I don't know. Jesus. Yeah, because it's. No, but it is made in Ireland. That's it. it is made in Ireland by a very, very good company. Um, John Jay says, good morning. Lazar says, hi, lads. Love you. Love you too, Lazar. Uh, when is Sika Hops coming? And if not soon, can you recommend some beginner plyo exercises? I know stuff like pogo jumps are good and like sprint, split jumps, drop jumps, bad, but not much more. So the place I would probably go if I was completely in the dark for uh, where to start plyos would be the UK SCA. I'm not sure if they plyometrics coursework is available online but i assume it's available somewhere somebody would have put that pdf somewhere um so they will go through there i think five stages of plyometric progression and i would literally just start at the start until you're nailing those so at the start is just bipedal hop and land so just landing mechanics then you have unilateral hop lands then uh broad jump into landing single leg broad jump into landing jumping from two legs landing on one leg and then you just progress from there that's where i would initially start off because it's a difficult thing in plyometric training it's difficult to onboard yourself if you're not fully aware of all the things that are happening you know if you're not fully aware of your body weight in relation to your tendon strength your body weight in relation to your relative reaction time your body weight in relation to your coordination the coordination between your center of mass and your your feet how agile you are uh, your ability to produce force your ability to absorb force on landing and um, that's a big thing with with plyometric training a lot of the time people think they're going to get a repetitive strain injury through overtraining of something like the achilles um or they might get a uh, plantar fasciitis from producing too much force and going for jumps that are too high or jumps that are too long or jumps that are overly weighted or overly intense most of the damage done or i would say the majority of the damage done during plyometric training and particularly onboarding and plyometric training is you landing after the jump or landing after the event so if you're doing simple very low hurdle hops it's that foot impacting the ground every time is what's going to hurt you. Or if you're doing some uh, lateral side to side stuff, it is the planting of the leg and absorbing the force that you're coming into that movement with is the issue. It's rarely the bounding off or the jump itself. If you go to Vershansky's website, he, he's kind of the godfather of plyometrics, I suppose. He has a very sensible progression in relation to 
Plymouth Development. There, you can buy his book there as well. Uh, for Shansky, I don't know how you spell it like V E R Shansky, I think, and uh, you should be able to find it from there. But uh, for Shansky, yeah, that's it's basically the exact same. The UKSCA one, I'd say they probably written. stole it from. Yeah. I'd imagine. Well, not stole it, but used his information. Yeah, absolutely. Jimmy Jam says a rival YouTube channel has a BJJ SNC program with a lactic capacity circuits. Uh, these involve uh, these involve explosive movements with 20 seconds rest for a three minutes total. Is this junk and will it make me slow? P.S. It's juggernaut and I don't know why I'm being all kind of <laughs> <laughs> So Did he actually say that? Just, oh my God. I, uh, do you know what? I haven't seen a lot from juggernaut recently. They don't seem to have, no. YouTube doesn't seem to show them to me as much. Uh, they were big jug life for years ago. It was a great Massive, podcast. Yeah. Uh, in relation to the so th that thing right is uh, when you're always talking about if you move slow you're training slow you know and if you want to train your speed you have to do movements at a fast speed and why we always kind of rag on the MMA athletes for doing the plyometric circuits with their conditioning circuits and their strength training circuits is that they're not getting the actual plyometric development done because they are training slow because they're fatigued so in theory technically that could work that kind of training because if in theory you kept moving as fast as possible there's no reason you couldn't do a large volume in a short period of time but in reality due to the nature of fatigue everyone gets slower everyone gets slower over time and explosive movements are higher energy demands they don't recover as fast you have a finite number of them they require high levels of coordination there's a lot of variability with them so you need to be aware that when you're doing a lot of these in a short space of time, the quality of movement will degrade and the speed of that will degrade and the fatigue will increase with them and thus eventually your speed will slow down. So I'd have to see what Juggernaut are doing before I'd, I'd rag on anyone, yeah. but I'd have to see what it is. But if it's if it's kind of maybe a, a hybrid thought, if it's like a certain number of movements, a 20 second rest for three minutes, that's not that long over the course of uh, hmm. conditioning compared to 20 seconds rest. So it could be like if it's two reps and then you rest 20 seconds and two more reps, that's probably fine. That's probably in the realm of what's going to keep you moving fast, but also building your capacity. So I could potentially see that working. Do we use circuit styles like that in any of our training? No, not at all. But in this scenario, I wouldn't rag it out. You know, the, um, I wouldn't be ragging on Juggernaut in that regard. It's possible they would, but I'd obviously have to see more of what they're doing, and maybe what they're reasoning for it before I'd give a, a concise opinion. But that's the theory behind it, at least. The so obviously we're blanket not going to rag on any coaches, right? But just but fuck Juggernaut. No, not at all. <laughs> but to to give a context where that style of training might be very useful. If you're somebody with a very, very, very low level of lactic threshold, right? So um, if you do 15 air squats in a row as fast as you can do them and you start getting a pump in your quads and you start getting that buildup of lactic acid um, and your lactic threshold, which is a very measurable phenomenon, is incredibly low, then that style of training can be very, very effective, right? Um, getting better, adapting to that. And certainly in many sporting applications, having a high lactic threshold is very, very useful. What we talk about all the time, and to give context to what Garf was just talking about, is if you're using those movements and that style of training to elicit any other style of response, right? So if you're using that as a stimulus to become more explosive, using that as a stimulus to have a higher level of aerobic capacity, using that as a stimulus for fat burning or lipid utilization in any way, that is not the most effective tool to get there. It's a very enjoyable tool. It's very snazzy. You feel great when you're doing it. Athletes tend to like it because it's really working hard and you're getting after it and it's those enjoyable movements that have that kind of good feeling that we talk about. But it's not the best tool. It's the killing the turkey with a sledgehammer instead of a scalpel. Now, I've killed quite a few turkeys in my time <laughs> and have not used a sledgehammer for them. The turkey tormentor. <laughs> Are you at those turkeys again? <laughs> Would you leave those turkeys alone? Um, right. Snoopy Flick said, what are your thoughts on a setting ball, like a weighted ball around 500 grams to strengthen wrist and fingers in volleyball? I got hypermobile wrist and fingers. So I'm looking to straighten it. So, um, Strength training does um, 
improve the cross-section area of your tendons to a certain degree, especially if you're newer to strength training. So if you're untrained in your hands, which it's rare you'll see that kind of thing, but if you're new on if you're new to strength training, and we talked about your grip strength being heavily related to your uh, overall just strength as a human being. Uh, they do to a certain period in the initial couple of months, you do increase the cross-section area of your tendons and ligaments in your hands. And if you're hypermobile, strength training does seem to reduce that over a period of time. Uh, that does kind of taper off to a certain extent once you get beyond the kind of initial beginner gains for strength training. Post that then, static holds are something that is generally a positive impact on cross-section area, post initial games for your tendons and ligaments. So holding things for generally beyond like 45 seconds is what you'll see. Static holds with weights is a very beneficial way of improving that integrity of your tendons. Uh, you can also just do regular strength training that should improve it. There's no real plyometrics you can do with your hands, but um, they do improve the stiffness and tendons in some scenarios. Um, but I, I'm not sure what that ball is, to be honest. I, I wonder, is it a volleyball thing? And I haven't seen it in particular. I'm wondering, is it a... So, like, as if you're setting like this? Yeah. And you're, like, kind of rebounding it up in the air? Which if, will be which will be plyometric if, and using that stretch shortening cycle, if that's what it is. If you maintain the integrity of your hands in the position you kind of want them to be, if you're not like, when the ball hits your hands, you're like, oh, shit. No, if you maintain them in a proper position, then I could see that working. Mm. What? So hypermobility is something, as weightlifting coaches, you come across a lot, particularly in female athletes um, and younger athletes. So hypermobility is a difficult one because training can make it better. But in a fair few cases, it will never go away. So training will give people the skill. So Mine went away. <laughs> yours went away. Yeah, 30 kilos. Gaining, gaining 30, 40 kilos. No. 30. 30. Nearly 40 kilos. Yeah. So increasing your body weight by 30%. No, sorry. Were you 70 kilos when you started lifting? I'm sure not 70 now. So I was. Nearly, yeah, 75. Okay. So a nearly 50% increase in body mass can allow you to, to, to solve your uh, your hypermobility. Might but not be great for volleyball. I was just saying, in that case, you probably wouldn't be able to jump very high. But So it's difficult because a lot of those things are genetic in their, in their makeup and the expression of those genes isn't necessarily something that's completely easy to turn off. Uh, so you being hypermobile might be due to a lack of initially skill and coordination in that in that motor unit so people who have hypermobile hips or hypermobile ankles once they start training and once they start getting into the general flow of things the muscle units associated with that joint and controlling that joint angle can become more skilled and then the level of hypermobility it's not necessarily that it will go away but they can control that a lot better so they're no longer hyper mobile but they're still hyper flexible so they still be able to go through the range of motion but they're importantly able to control their joint through the range of motion then when you start looking at the gain of tissues around there so Gareth talked about cross-sectional area of the tendons unfortunately in the hand we can't really add too much tissue to the muscle that's in the hand um, but you can certainly add some element of mass there like the mass. bigger Mass. Mass. The bigger you are, the more mass around the joint, uh, that biotensegrity of the joint, to use a, a flashy term from 2011, and there's a fly on the camera lens, uh, that will definitely have an influence on hypermobility. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that steroids. Steroids have a massive influence as uh, so your hormonal profile a lot of time people who are in the kind of obese category are holding a lot of fat tissue and not a lot of muscle mass so that balance between lean tissue mass and fat mass if that's not in the correct direction that adipose tissue will have you in a hormonal situation that always leads to you being hypermobile and um, so more muscle more lean tissue and less fat tissue will definitely make a big difference. Esh Lemon is saying, losing fat as a weightlifter, is there any related more to training that I need to consider other than caloric intake? I'm not talking cutting weight for a meat. I'm talking about becoming less obese. Yeah. I'll tell you what it is. You need to do cardio. I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you who he is. It's Rod yeah. Little. Uh, you have to do cardio as a weightlifter. And 
more intense cardio would be a little bit better for weightlifters, to be honest. Uh, but steady state, not better for weightlifters, but better for weightlifters to lose weight, not better for your weightlifting. Uh, you just, I don't see it with the weightlifters <laughs> because when I do see it, they're already lean, you know, yeah. and they're already fine. But for people who are obese, obese sounds like a slur now, doesn't it? I think obese is over 29 BMI or 20 or 32, isn't it? 32 is it BMI. But obese is, uh, Usually in those scenarios, you just need to be, you need to be doing some cardio, need to be doing a high volume movement. Um, yeah, it just doesn't work out. There's uh, two, like there's two other things I'd add to that. Definitely, it can happen. Definitely but... structured cardio work mm -hmm. on a weekly basis, not just hopping on a bike for 10 minutes. Um, structured, hard, like hard difficult cardio that's burning a lot of calories. Cardio. Cardio. Cardio, Jesus Christ. So the other two things I would say is that uh just raising your kind of non-exercise activity thermogenesis so neat is what you'd call it um and that is things like the amount of times you sit down and stand up out of chairs every day uh, the amount of walking you do that's non-exercise but it is physical activity related and um, the amount of times you leave your desk you parking your car slightly further away from the shop and walking there you taking the stairs instead of taking the lift or the elevator all of these things are vitally important. So non-exercise activity thermogenesis in training athletes can be up to kind of 80% of total calories burned during um, during a training day. So most of the calories you're burning every day have nothing to do with your training. They have to do with you just living life, you walking around the place, um, you breathing in and out, your brain using, using uh, glucose, right? So increasing that very actively and being very very aware that you're increasing it so every time you you park your car and walk somewhere you're parking it as far away from there as you you reasonably can every time you have the option to take the stairs you opt to take the stairs every time you sit at your desk and work you put a timer on for 20 minutes and after 20 minutes you hop up walk around and come back again you know like that's the first thing the second thing i'd say then is increasing muscle mass so doing bodybuilding in the same way we're talking about doing cardio doing bodybuilding in a structured fashion you're aiming to gain lean tissue mass so muscle is incredibly inefficient for the body to hold on to it costs a shit ton of calories to build and it costs a lot of calories to hold on to so you gaining just 200 grams of lean tissue mass can be massively influential to the amount of calories you're burning on a daily and weekly and monthly basis and will make that uh, that fat burning journey a hell of a lot better. Also, it, it acts as a great kind of pool for that additional glucose that's in your system. So if you are somebody who could be pre-diabetic or going along that line of you're, you're not, things mightn't be looking so good for processing uh, sugar every time you eat, muscle acts as a very good sink for that that like or that glucose you know it'll be stored within the muscle and then you're not having to process it with with insulin where does the extra seven kilos go you know is the thing like who knows where's it going to go on me like when i get all here if i go back Look to 105 say, here where's that going to be all like? in the neck where is it like legs get a bit smaller too like i don't think other people would notice but my legs have gotten way smaller yes your big legs are big anyway um <laughs> Unmix it. How much time should you wait between the clean and the jerk? Is it exactly dependent or is there a general rule for it? Uh, a general rule is as soon as possible. As soon as you finish the clean, reset, uh, get your breath, and then go as fast as possible. There's yeah. very rarely benefits of waiting. You want to time yourself, but you want to use the elastic energy of the barbell and you're fatiguing yourself every millisecond longer you stand with a weight on your chest. Okay, we have uh, one minute and 37 seconds left to finish the stream. So. I'm going to answer the banana bread's question. Uh, Q regarding, there's also a lot of great questions and we'll never yeah. get them all, but uh, this has caught me eye. Q regarding psilocybin and neuroplastic and like your comments against Adderall for neuroplasticity, how productive would the use of microdosing shrooms be for training? I think, again, it's just probably looking at the, not the wrong avenue for training, but I would say until you see some good reason that psilocybin would actually have some meaningful impact and skill development and uh, you're also making the assumption there if you were to use psilocybin you're making the assumption that you don't have the neuroplasticity to learn your skills and your sport uh, but that's very rarely the case um, 
you know, if you're in a scenario where you need to take psilocybin to learn your skill, you probably shouldn't be in that sport in the first place. Mm-hmm. There's probably other sports that you're more predisposed to, and you might say, what if I want to do the sports? But then in that case, I would say maybe you could try psilocybin, but I don't think you're going to see elite athletes taking psilocybin to kind of do that. And I know, in, for example, if you take jiu-jitsu, people love smoking weed before jiu-jitsu, but from what I see, I don't think it benefits them a lot. And you don't see high-level professional athletes doing it that frequently or not anymore. Uh, and they probably shouldn't be doing it if that's the case. Um, but in terms of psilocybin, you know, it could be an interesting self-experiment if you want, but quantification of psilocybin in relation to development of your skills would be a very difficult thing to do in relation to yourself, but also in relation to a like a large-scale interventionist study. Uh, will we see it someday? I'm not sure, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't think psilocybin would be it. And that neural rewiring you see from people who talk about psilocybin I'm not sure. I don't. I don't buy it just yet. I'm yeah. not, uh, you know, breaking people out of uh, what do they call them? You know, when you're stuck in a cycle of particular thoughts uh, or particular neural no- set networks. Yeah, like you're languishing in that. Yeah, if you're breaking people out of that, certainly. But that could be could uh, that literally could be a placebo effect. And I hate to be that person who throws that out there when it comes to these things, but it literally could be that kind of thing. Uh, it, not to say that psilocybin doesn't have a psychedelic effect, but it could be that due to the nature of the psychedelic effect being happening, you're getting a placebo effect from the psychedelic effect and you feel like you're ready to go again. But um, I don't I don't see that becoming a thing, but I suppose it's always possible. But I would be surprised. Yeah. To be honest with the brain, I would try and stay away from everything. Having been someone with a brain that's very messed up. Yeah. Uh, Rory O. Send Help says, Hi, lads. Finishing the powerlifting program, and I wanted to strip back my squat and revisit mobility to get ass to grass. But I feel like I need a maintenance phase for this. Any programs or advice for this? So this speaks to your question, but speaks to kind of the philosophy of training in general, right? Um, So a lot of the time with mobility work, people will then go back and they'll start squatting very, very light weights, which is important because it will allow us to do the motor pattern we're trying to do. And they'll go and do all their mobility work again, right? What I would say as a an adjunct to that is that what then happens when you want to go back and be a powerlifter again, right? So obviously you want to squat as deep as you can. You want to be as strong as you can. And what's the best way of doing that? Is it necessarily to as you say, strip back and go way back down and start getting ass grass and really working on mobility? Or is it to continue on a path of progress and continue that line of progression, but just do it in a slightly more intelligent way where you're improving your mobility all the time and getting closer and closer to ass the grass all the time, right? So um, it would be the equivalent of you're in a race car and you're in like one of those 24-hour races, right? And the seatbelt buckle in your car is broken so you can keep driving around and you can get your uh, navigator to reach across and strap you back in and fix it up as you're going or you can stop the car pull into the pit lane do the work on the car and then get going and start to catch up again right so this is obviously a calculation if you're in a formula one car they don't want to do pit stops or they want to do pit stops as as infrequently as humanly possible. And I think for most people, when they say this thing of, I need to strip back my squat, or I need to go back to basics, or I need to really just focus on this for a while, you would be much better off on a, maybe a, a slightly pulled back, just a slightly pulled back and slightly uh, regressed progression scale. So something that's not really pushing you quite so hard, but certainly not being in a full maintenance phase. Because a lot of the time you go into the full maintenance phase, you lose that progression with training and you might lose somewhere between 25 and 40% of your 1RM number very, very quickly will will kind of decay and fall off. And you're going to gain all the mobility. You might gain that motor pattern that will once again get you back to ass the grass. But then when you go back in and you do your prep phase and do your strength phase again, that mobility will soon leave you. You know, It's not something that's... that's uh, going to just stay there without without active work all the time so i think it's much better just to stay on a standard structured program maybe pull that 
the rate of progression slightly. So instead of adding 5% from week to week, you add 2% from week to week, or you add 2.5% every two weeks. And now you're still making progress with the lifts that you actually care about, but you have a very sensible and structured approach to your mobility work. And what that also means, again, is that, say, you do mobility and you do this for three or four months, you get your ass to grass squat back and everything looks great. You will now have gained that knowledge that you say, okay, I need to do two or three mobility sessions every week. After I do heavy deadlifts, I need to take one and a half days off. After I do squats, I need to do extra mobility on my hips and quads. And now you've gained a big bulk of knowledge that relates directly to you and directly to how you train and the outcomes of your training. And it, it's massively beneficial to have gained that knowledge. And now you have a system that works going forward in training. If you're taking a full pivot and you're never, ever going back to lifting heavy weights again, that's perfect just to strip back the squat, do a maintenance phase of the squat, do all the mobility work. But for most people, you want to continue to get better. And if you want to continue to get better, staying on standard programming that are slightly reduced in terms of their progressions, but standard program structure and then adding like it's an additive process with your mobility work rather than reductive. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope you like the new studio. And you'll obviously be seeing more in coming videos. And I hope you enjoyed today's live stream. We always enjoy doing them. So thank you for all your questions. And if we didn't get to them, feel free to ask the next day. Of course, we only have limited time to get to the questions. And there's always lots of great questions we don't get to. But, of course, we can only get to so many questions. We can only do so much. So thanks for watching, thanks, guys. guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we will see you later.